In this video, we will go over the concepts of work and energy. Work is basically force times distance, but we only consider it to be work if the force applied is in the direction of displacement. So let's say there is a box like this. We know from equations of motion that there will be a normal force and weight. Let's say there is a 200 Newton force that we apply like this. Now, the box will move to the right. So the work done is the force multiplied by the distance the box traveled. The weight and normal force don't do any work because the box is only moving in the horizontal direction. The formal definition of work is that a force will do work on a particle only when the particle undergoes a displacement in the direction of the force. So because our box isn't moving up or down, the weight and normal force don't do any work. Now, let's say there is a frictional force like this. The friction tries to keep the box from moving to the right. So we say it does negative work. So the 200 Newton force does positive work, while friction does negative work. Now let's say the 200 Newton force is applied at an angle of 30 degrees like this. The work done is only done by the X component of this force because as before, the box does not move up or down. The displacement is in the horizontal direction, so we only look at the horizontal components of forces. So in this example, only the 200 cosine 30 degrees does positive work. Let's now say that the force we apply is not a constant, but rather it's a variable force like this. So this force is dependent on the distance the box travels. Then how do we calculate the work? For that, we will integrate. Let's say the box moved 3 meters. So the lower bound starts at 0 meters and the upper bound is 3 meters. We then integrate the force and we can figure out the work that's done. By the way, some books use W to represent work while others use the capital letter U to represent work. The unit for work is joules or 1 newton meter. Another thing to consider about work is when it involves springs. Let's continue with our example by adding a spring with a stiffness of 200 newtons per meter. Now let's say our box started like this, where the spring is compressed 0.25 meters. Since it's compressed, the spring tries to come back to equilibrium by pushing the box to the right. This does positive work, and we see the work done by the spring is half times the stiffness of the spring times the displacement of the spring squared. In our case, the work is equal to half times 200 times 0.25 squared. If the stiffness of the spring is not constant, then as usual, we integrate it from the initial position to the final position. Now if our box was actually going like this, where it was initially moving to the left and the spring is now slowing it down, then the work done is negative because it's stopping the block. One last thing to consider about work is with weight. If the particle is moving up or down, then the work done by weight is simply weight multiplied by the distance the particle traveled in the vertical direction. We say the work done by weight is positive when the particle moves downwards. Now that we got work covered, we can head into the big equation which is this. It's T1 plus sigma u is equal to T2. This is called the principle of work and energy. It means very little like this, so let's expand on it. The first T1 represents the initial kinetic energy of a particle. The sigma u represents all the work added together, and T2 represents the final kinetic energy of a particle. Kinetic energy is half times the mass times the velocity squared. Another way of saying this is that the initial kinetic energy of a particle plus the work done is equal to the final kinetic energy. When we do examples, this will make more sense, so let's get to it. In this question, we need to find the distance the crate slides in order to attain a speed of 6 meters per second. We're given the coefficient of kinetic friction, so we do need to consider friction in this problem. Looking at the diagram, we have two forces, one pushes and one pulls. So both of those forces will do positive work, but since we're considering friction as well, the frictional force will do negative work. In simple terms, the two forces will move the box to the right, while the frictional force will try to slow it down. So our first step is to actually figure out what this frictional force is. And to do that, we will start off by drawing a free body diagram. So we have the two forces, the weight, the normal force, and the frictional force. Let's write an equation of motion for the vertical direction. That will allow us to find the normal force. Assuming forces upwards to be positive, we have the normal force, the weight, the y components of the two forces, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. 
But remember, the crate is only moving along the horizontal axis, not the vertical axis, so acceleration in the y direction is zero. Let's solve for the normal force. Now we can calculate the frictional force, which is the normal force, multiplied by the coefficient of friction. Let's think about work and energy. So the box moves in the horizontal axis. Any force that makes the box move in the horizontal axis, so the x components of the forces and frictional force, will do work. Whereas forces like weight and the normal force, which only has y component forces, will do no work. Keeping that in mind, we can write the principle of work and energy equation. So let's break down what's happening here. We got half the mass times the initial velocity, which is zero since the crate starts from rest. Then we add up all the work, so we got x component forces multiplied by the distance the crate moves, and the frictional force multiplied by the distance traveled. That's equal to half the mass times the final velocity squared, which is 6 meters per second. We can solve for s, which is our answer. So to gain a speed of 6 meters per second, the crate slides a distance of 1.35 meters. Let's take a look at this example. In this example, we need to find how far the block must slide before reaching a velocity of 50 meters per second. You should notice that unlike the previous question, we have a variable force. The force F is dependent on the distance traveled by the block. We also have friction, so first, we will calculate what that frictional force is. To do that, we need to draw a free body diagram. So we have the weight, normal force, the variable force, and the frictional force. Let's write an equation of motion for the vertical forces. Since the variable force has only an x component, the only force affecting the block in the vertical direction is weight and normal force. That's equal to the mass times acceleration, but the box is only moving in the horizontal direction, so there is no acceleration in the vertical direction. Let's solve for the normal force. Now we can find the frictional force by multiplying normal force by the coefficient of kinetic friction. Let's think about work and energy. Since this involves a variable force, we will have to integrate. Keeping that in mind, let's write our equation of work and energy. So we have half the mass times the initial velocity, then we add all the work that's being done together. That means we have the variable force, and since it's not a constant, we will integrate it from a starting position of 0 meters to s. s is the total distance the block travels. We also have the friction, which is then multiplied by the distance traveled. All of that is equal to half the mass times the final velocity. Going back to all the work being added together, remember, only x component forces will do any work. So forces like weight and the normal force will not do any work for the block because it's not moving in the vertical direction. Let's simplify and solve the integral. Now we can solve for s and that's our answer. Let's take a look at this question involving pulleys. In this question, we need to find the speed of cylinder A after it moved 2 meters from rest. So as with pretty much every pulley problem you face, the first step is to draw a datum. We can place it on the top pulley. Then we draw position coordinates. We have SA and SB. Looking at the diagram, it's one single cable, so we only need one equation. So we have 2SA plus SB is equal to the total length. If we consider a change in displacement, we can write that displacement using delta. The reason why we do this is because we want to figure out how much cylinder B moves when cylinder A moves 2 meters. So let's plug in 2 meters for the change in displacement for cylinder A, and then we can figure out how much cylinder B moved. We find that cylinder B moved negative 4 meters, but that just means it moved up 4 meters. We drew our position coordinates downwards, meaning any movement down was positive. Now the end result we want is to figure out the speed of cylinder A, which means we definitely need a velocity equation. So let's take the derivative of our initial equation. This equation represents the speeds of cylinders A and B. The next step is to consider work and energy. Here we think of the movements of cylinder A and B together because their movements are tied to each other. Keeping that in mind, let's write our equation. Since it's the addition of both kinetic energies of both cylinders, we will add the big sigma sign in front of the t's. Let's go through this equation. For the initial kinetic energy, the system starts from rest, so all the velocities are zero. Then we have the forces that do work. In this case, that's only weight, no other force affects the system. So when we did the displacement equation, we found that when cylinder A moves 2 meters down, cylinder B goes up 4 meters. It's important to keep this in mind, because while one cylinder does positive work, the other does negative work. 
Again, we assume down to be positive because that's how we drew our position coordinates. And since cylinder B is going up, it's going the opposite way, meaning the work that's done is negative. So we have the mass times the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the distance traveled. On the right side of the equation, we have half the mass times the velocity of A squared plus half the mass times the velocity of B squared. Now we have two equations with two unknowns. We can solve them to figure out the velocity of cylinder A and B. So we get a negative value for B, which again simply means that it's going opposite to the way we chose it to be positive. So it's going up at a velocity of 3.96 meters per second. Let's take a look at one last example involving springs. In this question, we need to find the total distance traveled by the block. So there are two ways to approach this problem. First, we can assume that the block hits spring B, bounces back, but stops before reaching spring A. Or, we can assume the block hits spring B and slides all the way to spring A and then comes back and stops. We will assume the first condition and see if it's true. If it is, that's less work for us, otherwise, we need to recalculate the distance traveled when it reaches spring A and do another equation to see where it stops. So let's start off by first figuring out the frictional force. For that, we can draw a free body diagram of the block. So we have the normal force, the weight, and the frictional force. Let's write an equation of motion for the vertical motion. Let's solve for the normal force, and now we can figure out the frictional force. Let's get started with our equation of work and energy. The block will slide towards spring B, compress it, and stop. Our first goal is to figure out how much distance the block travels. In other words, how much does the spring compress because the total distance that the block travels is 0.3 meters plus the distance the spring compresses. So first, we have half the mass multiplied by the initial velocity, then we have the work that's being done. We have the frictional force, which is doing negative work. So the block travels a total of 0.3 meters plus the distance it compresses the spring. Remember, even while the spring is being compressed, the block experiences friction. So the total distance the block travels before it stops is 0.3 plus s. s is the distance the spring compresses. Then we have the spring which also slows the block down until it stops, so it does negative work. So that's half times the stiffness of the spring multiplied by the displacement squared. All of that is equal to the final kinetic energy which is zero because the block is no longer moving. Again, s represents the distance the spring compresses before stopping the block. Now, the spring is pushing back the block in the opposite direction. So we write another equation for work and energy. This time, the spring is actually doing positive work, while the friction is still doing negative work. Remember, we're trying to figure out where the block will stop now. So the initial and final velocities are both zero. So our initial kinetic energy is zero because the block starts from rest. Then we have the frictional force doing negative work, while the spring is doing positive work. For the spring, the distance it extends is the same as the distance that was compressed. So we have 0.598 meters. And for the frictional force, remember that in addition to the compressed distance the block travels, it will go s meters until it stops. So s in this equation is the distance the block travels before stopping. Then on the other side, we have the final kinetic energy which is zero since the block comes to a rest. Let's solve for s. So that's the distance the block travels before stopping. Since that's less than 0.6 meters, the block doesn't hit spring A. So we don't need to do any more calculations. Let's add up the total distance the block travels from start. So we have the initial 0.3 meters, then the length of the spring compression, then the length of the spring extending, and finally the distance traveled before stopping. So the block traveled 2.036 meters before stopping. In this question, the spring had a stiffness that followed Hooke's law. But if it didn't, then you would write the force of the spring as an integral like we did with the variable force example. That should cover the types of problems you face in this chapter. I hope this video helped you gain a better understanding of work and energy principles. If it did, please give a thumbs up. Thanks for watching and best of luck with your studies.